So I am the questionably real John Doran, uh, and I write about music. And uh, the reason I'm here today is I edit a magazine called The Quietus. And um, I know everyone's as keen as I am to get straight into it. So I'm going to make the introduction short, but hopefully sweet. And like in my observation in 20 years of writing about music, it's kind of like uncommon for a musician to absolutely fundamentally revolutionise the cultural field that they stand in. But I think it's uh, very, very rare for a musician to do it several times over. And I think that like, Donovan fits comfortably uh, into the second uh, category. And, um, you know, like a lot of people, they talk about, uh, quite rightly, talk about uh, Donovan as single handedly kickstarting the psychedelic music revolution. And I've just got one thing to add to that, which is I think it's like reductive on one level because also what I perceive him to be doing was to kicking away at these really rigid walls around folk and by introducing, kind of quite expertly, introducing aspects of pop music, Indian classical music, heavy rock, uh, jazz especially, there was like, a, like, like an analogue of magical practice going on, like something new and vital was created uh, which was a greater than a sum of its parts. And in another aspect, which is why we're here today, um, we want to talk about a gift from a flower to a garden, which was so far ahead of the curve, so far ahead of the curve, that years later, it kind of, it was obvious in retrospect that it was the cornerstone of what we think of as acid uh, folk uh, today. So before we start, please give a warm round of applause for Donovan. So I, I, I find like, um, I was trying to look at it, um, like a shorthand um, for how to think of this album. And I wanted to, I started thinking about it as a string of firsts. And I thought maybe we could talk initially about how it was groundbreaking in terms of its form initially. And it's not just that it was rare for there to be a box set um, of music and lyrics and poetry and all of this wonderful stuff um, in the field of popular music it literally hadn't happened before so first things first where did this kind of magical idea for the box come from well where does where does a song come from and well poets have always said the muse brings it and if you're quick enough you can write them down and you've got a wonderful song and the idea of the box set came very quickly uh, two albums one for the parents of the 60s and one for the children that were being born. Uh, Clive Davis of Epic Records, we kind of began together. He opened Epic Records for Columbia and I was his first artist with Sunshine Superman. So it was a smash beginning. So it was very strange because uh, he said, what are you doing? Pop music doesn't have box sets. Jazz has box sets. Classical has box sets. Sometimes folk, but never pop but I said I want one and he looked at me and he said you mean two albums I said yeah he said with fine art paper and Sid Mora was with me who designed all the covers for Epic Records in New York City but he was a fine artist himself graphic he grew up with Warhol and they'd done all that in those graphic shops and now Sid Mora looked at Clive Davis top head of Epic Records and said, Clive, if you don't do this, you're going to be sorry. And so he said, OK, we'll do it. But he looked at me and he said, but you're going to pay for it. I said, what do you mean? He said, out of your royalties, fine art paper, seven color separations, two albums in a box, fine illustrated, 12 illustrations to 12 children's songs. You've got to pay for it. So I looked at Sid Mora and said, yeah. Let's do it. So the box was made. But it was totally unusual. Nobody got a box, you know. And what was it trying to do? Well, to try to do anything that was new and fresh. 
And my first album in 1965, already Bohemians had began to arrive in the world of pop music to design covers. A, a cover in the early days was really just two bits of cardboard stuck together, a band all wearing the same suits, jumping up and down on a roof, being photographed. That was pop packaging. Uh, the guys that were packaging were record company execs who did this for a living. They sold cars or furniture. or It was a completely different thing. But I thought the fans are really supporting my music and a few of us others that were arriving. And so they should be able to have a fine piece of work. Because I looked at my work that way. Surely the cover should look at it that way too. But it's totally unusual, totally unique. And I, I, you're right, nobody's done it since. I think it was the first box um, in pop music. Uh, talking about the duality of the album, you know, um, so not only, it's like it's two first wrapped into one. It's the kind of the double album, but it's a double album that needs to be a double album because of its theme. You know, one disc to one audience and one disc to another. And I've, just for my own personal curiosity, I wondered if, like, uh, Blake had been an influence on you. And I'm talking specifically about innocence and experience. Oh, yeah. Grew up in Glasgow. Uh, Irish grannies, Kellys and O'Briens, but Scots in there. My father read monologues and poetry. And the Scots, the Irish and the Welsh were, were brought up in the tradition. And it's the power of the words of very still alive in this, this culture. And so well, my father read me great poems and I was very literary, got polio as a kid, was in bed a lot, read a lot, and there was a library in my father's house. And so, but looking at this, people have had a look at my work and said, yes, Blake, Songs of Innocence, and, uh, uh, but also all the me metaphysical poets, uh, uh, obviously the the bards and the minstrel work uh, that comes from our tradition, the love songs, and also the haiku size haiku sized songs that I, that come through me are very much to do with those early days of uh, uh, the, the 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 Irish and the Scots poets that wrote in that form. So yeah, I come from those traditions. Sure, um, I didn't sit down and study Blake, but it was pointed out to me that I must have just picked it up. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, you explained in the liner notes at the time, like the kind of high concept of this album, talking to your own generation, almost like a, creating a roadmap for them, but also for the generation kind of to come. But also, you very pointedly um, kind of renounced um, like drug use, and I wanted to know, like, just in your own words, uh, like how you came to making this. I guess for the year, quite dramatic statement. What statement was that? Um, that you were like um, renouncing. I say, I guess you'd say renouncing the use of illegal. Yeah, drugs. Well, stop is the word. Yeah, <laughs> stop taking drugs. It was basically try meditation. It was getting too boring. Uh, it was okay on the streets, hustling about, sleeping in the beaches of Cornwall, smoking a joint and uh, uh, trying acid when it was legal. All these things were okay, but it was getting out of hand. And it was not just an experimental bohemian uh, ex uh, exploration of the inner world uh, on the streets of Hay Asprey. It was horrible. George Harrison went there and saw it. He was a good friend of mine. And he said, it's getting totally out of hand. And so basically, a simple answer, stop getting high, try meditation. And on, that's why George and I finally managed to run into a yogi. And it was a beautiful story of running into this guy because the stress and the pain that the largest, most successful band in the world called The Beatles was stressed, but also danger and, and terrible. Super fame was horrible. The wife of George Harrison was Patty Boyd. George wanted to play sitar. When he saw the sitar in the movie Help, he fell in love with the instrument. He asked Rabbi Shankar if he'd teach him. So George goes to India 
And while he's trying to sit cross-legged on the floor <laughs> with a sitar, Patty gets invited to Indian cultural events by the Shankar family. And while she goes to one event, they take her to an event where a yogi had just really come down out of the Himalayas from retreat and he was giving lectures. And she made a mental note. Somehow she, it made sense. She went back to England on the television one day she turned it on, and there's Maharishi, and he's in Bangor, and he's doing lectures. And she said, George, there's the guy I was telling you about. And we've got to go down and see him. They convinced the other three. George called me up and said, that guy that we thought we wanted to see called a yogi of some kind, it looks like he's here. And that was a big thing, you see. Not only for us, for the stress and the, uh, and the extraordinary changes we were going through, but our generation needed it. It was getting out of hand. I mean, dealers were moving in and using our songs as commercials to now push hard drugs. That was wrong. So it was a natural change. Why not meditation? It was much more interesting because we'd all been reading the books. And you may have been reading them too. And you guys know what these books are. What is the transcendental world? We crash landed into them into the transcendent with the, with the mushrooms if you could get it, acid, you, you could get it. But it was a very simple thing. Stop getting high, try meditation. Well, um, to use a, a kind of quite an esoteric uh, analogy, metaphor, um, when did you realize that there were multiple routes to the summit of the mountain? Uh, when I did what? We, uh, like what? Um, okay, I'm going to rephrase this. I think like there's there's a popular misconception. I believe that Eastern religion just appears in the UK in January 1968, fully formed. But as far as I understand it, I've got it, it. was always part yeah. of the beatnik well, uh, no, lifestyle, wasn't it? It's about on the Bohemian b bookshelves, of course. Yeah. And so when, when did your like when did your quest for enlightenment begin then? All right. Well, I think most of my generation, it wasn't a begin. It wasn't a conversion. Um, we haven't got time to talk about it, but one brings with it, when with one, uh, systems of belief. And when you see, read something in a book and say that feels, I understand that. Well, how did you understand it when you didn't know about it before? The way you did know it before, that's why you can understand it. So these things of it's a recollection, it's a dim memory being being stirred that you know about. And the reason why you know about it is a place where you go when you meditate. You've always been there, and there is no place to go. The journey leads to where you've always been. The, these books, when they said these things, re, they resonated for a generation, my generation. So it wasn't a, a conversion. It wasn't, ah, oh, we've got to go and find a holy man, and, and he's going to turn us on. No, we were looking. We had to check it, see if it worked. And it did work, and it does work. TM does work, it really does. But as simple as I can say it, and it's an odd thing to say, stop taking drugs, try meditation. Um, so obviously we've talked about it being a time of rich um, spiritual exchange, but I was wondering more about cultural. Like, can you talk to me a bit about when you were in Rishikesh, the stuff that was happening between you and various members of the Beatles, for example. Well, if we go there, we'll be here all night. <laughs> uh, and it would be wonderful to do it. But to tell you the truth, uh, uh, the, the reason why I had to go to the East for it is because the meditation, which is more in antique Western meditation, which had to go underground because of the arrival of Christianity and Islam, which swamped it. Uh, the secret societies of meditation went underground in the West. So it was completely still alive in the East. And that's why the Eastern ones came over here. For a long time, they've been moving about. Um, so the reason why I had to go there to get it was because it was everywhere there, but nowhere here. And so it, the, uh, uh, go, if we talk about going to the East, we start talking about finding oneself, uh, no, finding a spiritual path. No, we're all on a spiritual path already. 
if those books resonate with you, if, if something in a book resonates, uh, it means that you're already on the way, and this is that you have been led to this book by your own aspiration and your own wish to actually do something with your life. And so the journey leads to where you've always been. And we always loved it, George and I would laugh. He'd say, you know, you're reading the Buddhist books and I'm reading the Vedas. And I said, yeah. He said, well, the Vedas are older, the older than the Buddhists, you know. It was a joke. We were just making some fun. Because it doesn't matter how old or how young something is. If the truth is there and it rings a bell, yeah, yeah, it's good for you. And uh, so it was like when we actually got it, it's like you can't describe it. And you have to be it with a teacher. And this teacher called Maharishi was passed the, this special simple method by his guru called Gurudev, who was the head of the Chankarashara dynasty of yogis. And George knew more about it than I. And he said, look, this guy looks like the thing, but the only way you can check it is to do it. Uh, it's like saying to uh, a scientist, uh, you know everything, but can you describe the taste of water? Oh, I can't. Why? Because you have to experience it. There are certain things that you just can't describe. You can't describe what the, uh, the, the, what, who you meet or what you meet when you meditate. Try it. It's great. But you have to be with the right teacher and you have to do it in a certain way. I'd say TM. So I can't tell you the stories of going to India, but I'll tell you that he's on the back, Maharishi, because this was 1968 when it arrived. It was made in 67. But 68 was uh, an extraordinary year, and I'll take it simple. Yeah, the whole world, the whole media arrived in Rishikesh <laughs> following four beers, me, and one beach boy. And Mia Farrow was there, and a bunch of other seekers with no celebrity name, and we spent six weeks there, and we studied, and we brought it back. It is extraordinary. Um, it was unfortunate that we couldn't find it in the West. I mean, the Western form of spirituality is a different game completely. Donovan, what's your favorite song on this <gasps> album? I have changing favorites, of course. Uh, um, I can think of one, yes. It would be on the, what I call the children's for little ones section. Um, I can actually explain a little bit about why the sound of the children's one, why isn't it all one, two, three, four, jump up and down, jump up, you know, kid stuff. Why wasn't it like that? Uh, or why wasn't it like uh, uh, Broadway musicals like Disney does, you know, take a fairy tale, make it extraordinary animation. But the music was kind of modernly uh, too jolly. There had to be something, that I said, that children respond to, which is... <sighs> internal it was romantic and internal so i'd already been doing these songs and one of them so the music and if you know my music well that there is a certain temper that happens in my music which is People used to say, it's real stoned. Donovan plays ball ballads in a tempo where it's not quite a tempo and it's almost stopping, but it's kind of there, but it isn't there. So I've always felt and played that way. So I realized over the years it's a special technique that must have been taught in the ancient bardic schools of harp and, and, and recitation of certain poetic forms, which you can read about where you could actually put people to sleep by a certain way of singing and delivery of vocal. And there's a way I'm speaking to you. And that's why people who bought this, they said, we love the children's part. I said, why? When we want the kids to go to sleep, we play the children's part. 
I said, and, I, and they said, I, it's not, we're not saying that your music is boring, but something in your music sets people at ease, and our children love it. Rain has showered far her drip. Splash and a trickle running Plant has flower in the sun Shell and a pebble sunning Soon begins another spring Green leaves on of berry Chiff, chaff, eggs are painted by Mother bird eating cherries In a misty, tangled sky Fast a wind is blowing in a newborn rabbit's heart. River life is flowing, so begins another spring. Breathe, breathes, and of berries, chiff, chaff. Eggs are painted by mother bird eating cherries. Thank you. And that was the beginning of uh, uh, that song coming was the beginning of an, uh, an urge in me, uh, the muse, thank you again, about ecology and green. So I'm kind of the first green man as well, uh, being able to uh, not just sing about we should love Mother Nature more, but actually play music that actually can be a soundtrack to looking at a field of blossom or a field of corn or something in a certain way, a transcendental uh, way of uh, making a song for children. Yeah. I want to talk to you about um, this beautiful new edition. And I guess to start by asking um, how you and State 51 Conspiracy fit together in terms of artistry and craft. Well... It's the label, S51, who has been uh, working on my material for some time now, making vinyl and also CDs. Uh, I still make CDs of the music that I make. I like the sound. It's big. And uh, when S51 said uh, five years ago, uh, we want to make it, I said, you'll never pull it off because many of the papers are not available uh, it's a long process and then they said ah but we have a secret and I said what's that it's a guy called Daniel Mason in a company called you've heard of this guy something else and he's done boxes before I said yeah but boxes are boxes and maybe you can get close but how can you possibly do this one when Sid Mora I tell you, the guy in New York who did my covers, he had, a, he had 16 people working for him uh, in his graphics uh, uh, album design, and he had resources that were huge. He could just pick up the phone and get paper from Japan and uh, extraordinary uh, uh, favors from people. And so 
when Daniel started it and he went on the quest to find these parts, I said, this guy knows, he'll do it. But year and year out, it took a while, I must say. But uh, inside, our, in the press release, I think there's more production details in the press release than the press release about me. I said, look, you're only talking about me this much and you're talking about the album that much. And I realized why. The work that has gone into it is extraordinary. Um, you know, <laughs> and it's a limited edition. It's, it's a collector's item. And uh, I had my first interview with the MOOF. Is that what that wonderful uh, magazine is? And uh, Melanie walked in and she's smiling in the Gore Hotel where I'm staying for some interviews. And she opens her bag and brings out her copy when she was 14. So the first interview, there it was, the one that's just been reminted, as it were, and the archeology span to find those parts was huge. And then she had hers, and it looked not bad. A lot of them are banged about, you know. And uh, so it was a wonderful confirmation that it has been loved. And this one is re brand new now. It's not cheap. <laughs> there's, on, there's only 500 of them. Uh, the music is also inside for the kids in a cue card. It will be in a QR card. Uh, because if you, it's now grandparents and grandchildren. It might even be great grandparents and grandchildren. I don't know. But it's a very unique parent uh, child experience. But you can't let the kids put the vinyl on. <laughs> so inside the pack, they've got they can scan the digital, and that was important too. And so yeah, it was a difficult it's a difficult job, but it's been achieved. It's extraordinary, and it's in mono. When uh, when 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 himself uh, uh, Gordon said, uh, well Daniel at first he said we we're, we're going to do it in mono. I said you're going to do it in mono. I said yeah. I said, how are you getting on with the papers? He said, not very good, but I think I've traced them down. So this guy, Daniel Mason and the label, tracing down the actual papers. And if you couldn't get the papers, I mean, finding places and calling them and saying, oh, no, we don't do that anymore, but we might have some old stock. <laughs> that kind of job is what it was. For me, the music, mono is best for this, yeah. The infrared photography. Now, Carl uh, Ferris came to me and he said, I go to the, the American base and I get this film called Infrared that they use in the military to see what parts of the forest are still alive from above in their airplanes. But something strange happens. That is the strange thing that happens. In 67, we went on the, the photo shoot. His first photo was with Hendrix, but that was in a studio, and you don't get the effect of infrared on the open countryside. And uh, I guess if you look at what happens to my, my look and what I'm wearing, you see, down in the Portobello Road, there was a lot of interesting stuff in those days. And Una, I think, Ula had a great store, and uh, she had, this, I think this is a Bulgarian or Romanian wedding gown made for a special occasion and so I bought that and so I was wearing chicks gear long before anybody else um, I say, but I, not only that it's glam isn't it see what happens there's no makeup but it looks strange and so we love I loved the look and so that was obvious now here I am as the Gaelic shaman which I really am and uh, it was a mission, what I was on. It wasn't, I just got discovered in a club. It was intentional, well, everything that I followed the muse to do. Gypsy Dave and I, on the beaches of Cornwall at 17 years old, we made a vow. Society is mentally ill. Right, we've got to invade with the bohemian ideas, invade popular culture. Um, it's a story, it's another story to tell at another time. But the muse led me in the right places at the right time. And it was always the one guitar, the one song, 
and the one intention. How do you actually invade popular culture and invade it with popular uh, songs, but then fuse it all? It was no problem. Fuse jazz, classical, blues, folk, Indian, Arabic, Gaelic, but essentially it was always just me and the guitar. And so it's still just me and the guitar. But there's also the pop element, jazz pop element on the other, the other uh, disc in there. And that was a lot of fun uh, to be making too. Uh, I have a song that I could actually maybe play in a moment that would illustrate the other, the other section maybe, or a popular song before we leave. What's your next question? Hmm. Um, I guess, like, I'm going to wrap it up quickly before handing it over to the audience. And I just want oh, to. Oh, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> Go on. Well, you recorded the second album for the generation of children to come. And, like, f I was part of that generation. You know, I was born in 1971. Did you hear them at the time? Um, well, the I didn't hear it quite when it came out, but maybe but later. A, a few years later. Okay. You know. uh, but, you know, I have a. Uh, a boy now who's a child who is part of the coming uh, Generation Alpha, they'll be, they'll be called. And I wonder, do you have like aspirations for these kind of beautiful messages to reach a new audience? It has to be played when they're young, young, quite young. I don't mean to condition them or to uh, <laughs> induct them into anything spiritual or anything, but while those first seven years, which we know... Uh, the first seven years, then you get a set of teeth, don't you? Another set of teeth, uh, and stuff like that. But when when the w w when the child is open, uh, it's very important. Uh, it's not just to play the music when they're young, but this could be putting them to sleep when you've had enough of them. You know, when you're trying to get some sleep yourself, put the album on. It's okay. It will happen uh, because of this very slow myth of my almost transcendental beat that I have uh, for these particular songs. But if, if you've got a kid and you're wondering what's going on, what Linda and I, who's not here, have learned is this. First of all, you've got to find out what their star sign is. As soon as you know their star sign, study it and you'll find, and then you're going to study the child as the child starts walking, and you can see whether the star sign, which points to certain activities that they prefer or that they naturally do, astrology is a very strange uh, uh, study, it's not fortune telling really, it's character study and you can see say look there and if you see something like a dancer is a Libra uh, may show some dance, encourage it uh, and then study it more, the problem is school well, school is going to be what school is. If you can find a school these days that's got some meditation or relaxation, uh, breathing, choose that school. And after a while, you may see this child, you encourage this child to do those things. None to do with ABC, <laughs> arithmetic, and English language. It's something to do with the, the encouragement of your child. But this kind of music, when they're young, actually gives a certain benefit, uh, a basis that they will feel that is nothing to do with anything they're going to see on television. This is a kind of a timeless sound that I make. Yeah. Um, if you want to ask a question, raise your hands and I will repeat the question back. Person at the front, please. So was the first lyric of Colours based on histori historical fact? <laughs> yes. We mean something that happened in my life. Yeah. The verse, yellow is the colour. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, later I'm just mad about saffron. But saffron is the, that colour, you know, that red kind of Buddhist colour. Yellow is the colour of my true love's hair. Well, it was really, yeah, uh, a girl's hair colour, yeah. Um, is that it? <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the where uh, Lennon and I are not supposed to mention too much of the Beatles because everybody thinks I'm showing off. 
I just happen to go on with them very well. We are kind of the same. Out of Liverpool, out of Belfast, and out of Glasgow, the cities were bombed silly. And we grew up in bomb sites. So I got on with Van Morrison and the Poor Beatles like a house on fire. We had a similar Irish, Scottish background, actually. And so all of that colour stuff, we all... The Bohemian musicians, mostly, were wanted to be painters, wanted to be in art school. The girls were much more interesting. Uh, the teachers were much more interesting. Uh, everything was better in art school. And so some of us dabbled, and we were painters, but we put down the paintbrush and picked up the guitar. And so, especially Lennon and I, there was a lot of painterly things. So as simple as I can say, yellow, green, blue, these things were naturally to put in a song. Yeah. Someone else, please. Uh, at the back there. What piece of advice would you give to someone trying to find spirit? Sorry about that. I can't help. Uh, uh, what piece of advice would you give to somebody trying to find um, a sense of spirituality in the modern age? Gosh. You'd have to want to do it. Not you. So I presume this person is... Uh, interested what i told you was if you read something and it, and you say that feels i seem to feel that then the only the only thing one can say is you'll be drawn to the books you go into a bookshop and you'll be drawn to it or, or somebody will force it on you <laughs> you know that one you've got to read this it's amazing and often you say yeah okay well well uh, uh, what advice? Uh, if you're looking for it, then you've really already started it, or else you wouldn't be looking for it. By the way, there is no question that doesn't have an answer. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the question. These are called dualities in spirituality. You know, you have, you haven't. You're up, you're down. So to actually want to do something in the spiritual world means you're already doing it. You just got to find the right one for you, because everybody's got a different way. Like I said, no, if you're a star sign, uh, you know, uh, you've got your star sign, you might have to read up on, on the characterizations of star signs. They're interesting. Uh, certain signs uh, are drawn to certain things. So if you're already on the path, um, nobody can tell you the book that's going to turn you on. Anyone else uh, over the place? Yeah, the Beatles had, uh, my understanding, a kind of disillusionment with the Maharishi. And I'm wondering if you know why that was and if you had a similar disillusionment. Sorry. Uh, uh, so I know that the Beatles went through a period of uh, disillusionment, I guess, with the idea of... Um, kind of Eastern religion and I was wondering if uh, or the gentleman was wondering if you'd been through any other kind of like you know um, a you're, turbulence. You're talking about doubt? Yes. <laughs> well that's Carl Jung you have to read about that for that one. The very thing that you um, love about someone teaching you it will uncover if that's a true teaching, it'll uncover a part of you that you're not willing to face. Therefore, you project, I think Carl Jung calls it projection, you project onto the teacher the very thing that you can't face, uh, putting down everything that the teacher actually passed to you. Do, you. do you get it? It's not nothing to do with the teacher. It's nothing to do with anything except doubt. It's not doubting whether the guy was the right. It's the, you're just not facing something in yourself that it's been uncovered. Nobody's doing anything to you that you can't allow them to do. But the press, when they got hold of it, and, and John writing the song, uh, that was all part of projection. Uh, it's not to do with the teaching. It's, it happens a lot. Uh, uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, I <clears throat> was enjoying these questions about meditation so much i went into a meditative state myself and forgot that ask, i was on ask, stage uh, ask me what my favorite color is <laughs> um, it's I, not yellow <laughs> sorry go on. Uh, what's your favorite flower oh iris 
That's not an iris. No, I, I haven't got my glasses <laughs> on, but uh, I think we've got time for one or two more. So um, can I see like another hand and maybe, or, oh yes, over there. Uh, the person is wondering, what is the song you're most happy with? Oh. Um, I'm happy with them all, really. Uh, uh, it's extraordinary. My father said, when he was quite old, and we didn't see each other so much, he said, May your muse never desert you. Now, he was a literary guy, and he was well, well, well self-taught. And he read in two voices, the common comic voice of a narrator of stories and poems and monologues that are for enjoyment at parties and he had a noble voice and it was a different voice completely you know so uh, you could say that that song I sang you from the album had some tones in it that would say that those kind of songs are very important to me um, it's very hard to tell which ones, but it's when it reaches a certain tonal place, uh, which is nothing to do with the words, is it? Or what the meaning of the words is, but it's an actual sound of the word. And so those songs are very important to me. I feel, I feel that in every concert there is two or three songs like that. And I'm not doing concerts yet, but I'm coming back soon, I hope. Thank you. Uh, that seems like a really good juncture to ask you, would you mind playing uh, another song or two for us? Well, see, let's see. By the way, this is, this is my guitar, and her name is Kelly. She's an Irish girl, B-O-I, because her motifs are from the Book of Kells in Trinity College Library. Um, I not only encourage great craftsmanship in the design of covers, um, developed it with painters and writers and, and makers of covers, I also developed with guitar makers for them to continue this craft. <laughs> Kelly. Now Kelly, um, she is an Irish girl and these are the motifs from the Book of Kells. The Book of Kells of course is 1200 years old and the colours in that book are amazingly vibrant. The, the, the Viridian green and this extraordinary Rowanberry red and then on the back which is almost all gone the Lapis Lazuli blue. Um, and so this guitar was made by a craftsman just like, just like Daniel Mason made this and his name was Danny Farrington in the United States and he made this beautiful thing um, uh, and so making guitars is a very important thing too to keep those crafts going <laughs> There's a little capo in the in the guitar case, uh, Sebastian, somewhere. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Well, <laughs> oh. well. <laughs> the first song that I re recorded and I had a hit in the chilly hours and minutes of uncertainty I want to be in the warm hole of your loving mind but I feel you all around me and to take your hand along the sand Ah, but I may as well try and catch the wind 
When sundown pierces the sky, I wanna hide a while behind your smile. And everywhere I'd look, your eyes I'd find. For me to love you now would be the sweetest thing. Would make me sing. Ah, but I may as well try and catch the wind. Ah, but I may as well try and catch the wind. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, so I was at a party and Gypsy said, this is nothing happening at this party. It was in Sweden. It was in 1966. We were on tour. And he said, Don, write a song, will you? And get everybody to sing along. This party is dead. So I took the song back to England and my, my producer, Mickey Mouse, the Phil Spector of Britain, he said, what have we got? because a song used to be on the chart and then it dropped. We didn't say this, but I was really attacked by the folk world because I said it's singles, B side and A side. This is going to open the door for all these millions of young people to read the proper books, the poetry, and get going in their own life. And so a single is important. So Mickey and I would meet, and if a single was dropping off the chart, you had to get in the bloody studio, make another one, and then it'd go up the chart. And this was happening in the 60s all the time, one song. And so Mickey said, well, what have you got? We've got to get another song out there. And I said, well, I've got something, uh, but I only wrote it to, in a dull party in Sweden, to get everybody to sing along. And he said, when he heard it, yeah, Don, and the whole bloody world's going to want to sing along too. We're going to record it. Maybe you could help me. I'm just mad about saffron. Saffron's mad about me. I'm just mad about saffron. She's just mad about me. What's my name? They call me Mellow Yellow. Quite rightly. They call me Mellow Yellow, John. Quite rightly. They call me Mellow Yellow. You do that, right? I'm just mad about 14. 14. It's mad about me, but I, I'm just mad about 14. She's just mad about me. Come on, they call me Mellow Yellow. Quite rightly, where are you, John? They call me Mellow Yellow. They call me Mellow Yellow. Electrical banana It's gonna be a sudden craze Electrical banana It's gonna be the very next phase They called it Mellow Yellow Quite rightly They call me Mellow Yellow Quite rightly they call me Mellow Yellow, oh yeah. They call me Mellow Yellow, Mellow Yellow. Yeah. John, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. Yeah, man. Okay. Uh, let's have I'm going to come another... down and say hello to you guys, maybe. Let's have another very big round of applause for Donovan.